Hello once again, um, my name is Dennis Baker, the Business Program Director. Thanks for everyone in our audience. Thanks to, for those who are watching on the live stream. We're excited to be here with you guys. Um, we're gonna jump in and get started and have our panelists introduce themselves. So we'll start here, go ahead. Hi, my name is Greg Evans. I currently am editing Scandal. I've edited Prison Break, Touch, um, Private Practice, a couple of other shows, and that's it. Uh, I'm Lisa Bromwell, and I uh, currently am doing House of Cards. I'm Jordan Goldman. I got promoted to editor on The Shield. I've cut The Shield, Terriers, uh, 24, Live Another Day, and uh, mostly work on a show called Homeland. Um, I also wrote a book called uh, How to Avoid the Cutting Room Floor, an editor's advice for on-camera actors, which I encourage everybody to check out after this. <laughs> it's a good book. I read it. I'm Jill Danyenika. Um, I was on Switched at Birth for ABC Family Freeform for six years, which I edited and then directed. And now I am on Pretty Little Liars. I've also cut for J.J. Abrams, Undercovers, and uh, what else? A few other things back there. That's about it. Hi, my name is Monty DeGraff, and uh, right now I'm about to uh, cut a show for ABC, a new show called Designated Survivor. Uh, I did two seasons of Netflix Daredevil, and I started many years ago on, Dare, on uh, Law and Order, uh, and have worked on comedy shows and lots of dramas, so everything but reality television. <laughs> <laughs> nice, let's give him a hand and say thank you for being here, yeah. So we're going to start today just kind of learning their process, understanding um, their part in this big machine that we call the industry. So can you guys, um, I'll let anyone who wants to start, kind of give us some bullet points of what, is, what does an editor do? What's the stuff that when you're kind of in your hole working on, what are those things? What are your expectations? Things that a lot of people don't see. Anybody can start. Well, just on a strictly mechanical level, uh, what we do is we take all the footage that's filmed on the set, we watch it, we evaluate the performances, and we put the scenes together for the first time. So we're the first person who watches all of your performances, and we're the person who says, well, maybe, you know, let's open this on the big wide shot of the crowd, and then we'll cut to a close-up of the person speaking, and then cut to a super close-up of the sweat bead, or maybe we'll start on a close-up of the sweat bead, and then cut to a wide of the audience. We do the first pass of all of those decisions. So they film lots of takes of lots of angles on the set. It all comes into the cutting room the next day. They continue filming, so the director does not sit with us while we're doing our initial pass. The director stays on the set and continues working. And based on some notes that we have from the script and from our own instincts, we start putting the show together. Uh, we, after we've assembled the entire show, the director comes in, we work with them. After we're done with the director, we work with the notes that we get from the studio, notes that we get from the network, and notes that we have from our showrunners and producers, and then eventually we lock picture, and that's probably about a month after shooting. That whole process for one episode on a regular cable drama, not Netflix or Amazon, but like a regular cable drama, that takes about a month. Um, is that process for Netflix, what's kind of your process of your guys' time frames as well? Is that a little different? It's pretty much the same for Netflix. We shoot our shows, our show shoots for 10 days, which is longer than most network shows, which means everything is longer. Um, for, you still only get four days for the director's cut, but um, we also cross-board shows, so we do two episodes at a time, which means you're getting dailies for 20 days. Um, but it's the same process. You put together the first cut, you work with a director, you work with the producers, you deal with studio notes or network notes. And then we spend time, uh, editorial uh, oversees the sound and also has a lot of input with the music. Yeah, the one thing that can be a little different with network, which I work in network, is that um, we're doing maybe 22 episodes at a time and so at the end, we're like, in the beginning, I might have a six-week process to get a cut done. When I'm doing the finale, I might have 10 days. And that's from last day of shooting to delivery. So we still have to do the same amount of work. We just have a lot less time to do it sometimes. So that's the only difference there. And uh, we, we rotate because one editor can't do an entire series themselves. It's just too much work. 
So generally, dramas will have a three editor rotation. So Greg might do the first one, Lisa does the second one, I do the third one. By that time, Greg is available again so he can do number four, she does number five, I do number six, we rotate. You guys are working on a different show, that's, that's why you didn't get episodes. Monty and I are off on another show. I just wanted to expand at the beginning, the beginning of the process. Uh, we get a script and it all does begin with the word. And whether it's a first season show or a show in its seventh season, the script tells us what our episode is going to be about. Um, obviously, the longer a show has been on the air, and all of us are in television, as we've said, um, so it's different for, than feature film process. But in television, we get our script, and that informs us what our goal is with the, the show. So when we say we do the first pass, it's not purely from our instincts and experience. We're also trying to serve what the direction of the script is. Um, some shows, the showrunner plays a big role in informing the director, and sometimes the editor is pulled into it, giving notes on things that aren't in the script but are important that the director needs to accomplish. And if the editor is part of that conversation, we are informed of where we're going. So when the script comes to us, we have an idea of what we're going to try and accomplish in that particular scene. Yeah, in the last few shows that I've been on, I'm a part of that in pre-production. It's called a tone meeting. And they have the writer, the executive producer, the director, and the editor all in this meeting. And we go through scene by scene and talk about what the writer intended, what the pitfalls might be. Um, sometimes they're talking about specific actors and things that we need to massage with a specific actor or performance. Sometimes it's sets that we need to be cognizant of. And so for every single scene, we'll go through and we'll talk about the tone, um, the emotional tone, the content tone, the plot etc. And also bringing it back to past episodes. So what the director who maybe hasn't worked on the show before needs to know about what's happened in the past with our characters that's informing them now in this episode. So that all happens at the tone meeting and I'm there. We all take notes and if I'm confused when I get dailies in and I don't know which way to go necessarily because I have a variety of performances to choose from, I'll refer back to my tone notes and I'll see what the writer and the executive producer intended and I'll try to work it that way. Are you guys ever in conversations with the director during the shooting of the episode? Do you ever have to go back with them saying, hey, I need this or need that? Or is it basically just notes from tone meeting? No, you'll go. I mean, my, I'm lucky because the show that I work on, we shoot in the same place that we edit. And when I would first go down to set, they'd be like, oh, what's wrong? What's wrong? Why, why, why are you here? And I'm like, oh, no, I just want to see what's going on, you know? But. Like with my show, there are a lot of different gags and stylistic things that we do. So if I have a new director, I will be like, hey, in this part of the script, make sure you do this, make sure you shoot through glass, make sure you do that. And then even some of us will text the director before those days because the director gets so busy and be like, hey, remember to do this, remember to do that. So you just try to help them out. Um, but yeah, sometimes they'll call you down. Usually they'll call and say, did I get it? Um, they won't call you down before because you're not part of that part of the process. Um, so that's usually how it works for us, for me. Yeah, you usually, uh, you'll talk to the director if, if generally if, uh, if they have a question about whether or not a scene works or not. Um, some directors want to see things in process as they go along because I think it helps them in going forward and knowing what they're looking for in terms of performance to see something that's actually been cut together. And so I always make sure, and I think most of us make sure that we're always available to the directors when they need it to, to see footage, whether, you know, and with technology, you know, it's really easy whether you're there, you know, just down the street or across the country. In a recent episode that I cut, I actually storyboarded several scenes with the director in pre-production. So we worked on it together. She told me her vision, and then we wrote it all out, and we looked at it. I made some suggestions. She made other suggestions. So we planned it all out before she got on the set, which was really helpful for both of us, actually, because then when I got the footage, I knew what she wanted to do because we'd talked about it. Um, um, let's talk a little bit about um, 
you, you talked about the episode from kind of when you get it to being locked. Um, we're gonna talk about kind of notes with showrunners and directors a little bit later on. Let's start with Studio Network. What kind of notes do you receive from them? What other conversations you have? I, you, some of you said in the green room that you don't get a lot of notes from them. Kind of talk about your individual processes with studios and networks. Well, first we should probably explain to everybody what Studio Network is because I think most people assume that they're interchangeable. Uh, the studio is generally the company that's putting up the money to make the show. And then the network is the channel or the company that airs it. And they're not always the same company, which is sort of not very intuitive. Like, for example, Homeland airs on Showtime, but it's not made by Showtime. It's actually made by a division of Fox called Fox 21, and it's licensed to Showtime. And there's some complex legal agreements about who has rights and, and how much and all that. But Fox 21 is the studio. So they get first pass on the notes. And they have the first opportunity to say, you know, more of this, less of that. We don't understand this. Nobody understands why the bomb went off, that sort of thing. Um, once we do their notes, then we send it to the network. And the network, because they're the people that air the show, generally their notes weigh a little more heavily because they're the people at the end of the day that are more identified with the final product. And we'll get a lot of the same sets of notes from them. And um, you know, getting notes can actually be really good because it's somebody who's got fresh eyes who can look at the thing and evaluate whether or not it's doing what it's intended to do. Because by the time it goes to the studio, we've all probably watched every scene 60, 70, 100 times. We watched a bunch of all of the dailies. We watched a bunch of it when we were putting it together. We watched a thousand permutations. We watched a bunch of the director with the showrunner. Like we've watched it so much that at a certain point, it becomes a little difficult to be objective anymore. And so you need what's called fresh eyes. And so when we send it to the studio and they re send it back and they say, we don't understand what triggered the character to take this action in this scene, then you, then you look around and you're in a room full of people who wrote the script and performed it and you know, edited it. And to us, it's, it's totally obvious. But if it, if it doesn't make sense to somebody outside the process, then that means we have an issue and we have to fix it. So it's actually good sometimes to get these notes. Sometimes you know, you, you get ridiculous notes, like on, I heard on Homicide, they got a note once, do we have to show so much dead bodies? <laughs> and the showrunner was like, well, the show is called Homicide. <laughs> but generally, the notes can be very helpful, but some of them can be confusing, and, and sometimes there's still an, an argument going on between the showrunner and the studio or the network where they didn't like something when it was in the script phase because they get to have some input on the script, and they're still trying to resolve that battle now, but it's been shot, it's in the show, it's gotta get done. Um, one thing that, um, maybe to clarify, the, the sequence of events is that the editors get the dailies while it's being shot, we cut it, and we create an editor's cut. And in most of our cases, I would assume, those are, um, those are temp sweetened with music. So we put in sound effects, and I love choosing music. Um, so we, we put in the score and, uh, scores and source, like tunes, actual songs, and we get it all ready, send it to the director, and then they come in for four days to work with us. And the director gets his or her cut. And then once that's finished, the producers come in, and they get four days with us to work on their cut. That cut goes to the studio, they get one day to turn it around, and then the network gets it, and they get their day. So that's the sequence of events. Once, the, once we address the network notes, then we lock it, and we go on to sound sweetening and color correction and uh, ADR, et cetera. But all of that is happening, like after we lock the picture, all that color correction, visual effects, music, all that stuff is happening while we're busily cutting our next show. So we don't have, in the standard workflow, we don't have a huge amount of input on that stuff until we go to the final mix playback, and then we can give notes on that. But there's just really not time in, in the way the machine runs for us to have a lot of feedback on things that happen once picture is locked, unless you know, you're working on something that gives you a lot of time. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, when you guys are working on an editor's cut and a little bit about looking through the dailies and all the different takes and stuff and what are you kind of, what's the broad strokes you're looking that you need an actor to deliver for you to go, okay, I, I think I got something here to work with. What are kind of, kind of the, we'll talk about the details, but what are kind of some of the broad strokes of what do you need from an actor? Well, um, when I first watch the dailies, I try to watch them and then I mark anything that I have a reaction to, anything that gets my attention, anything that makes me do anything. 
And what I mean by that is I'm like, oh, that even hor not horrible, but just something where I'm like, oh my God, that, that's something that I, I'm, I'm interested in. And then I start to try to build the scene the way that the script has it or the tone that I've had. And then what I find myself is I'll, I might try to shoehorn some of those things in, those elements, but really I'm looking for, whether it's a guest actor or the main actor, I'm looking for you to grab my attention. I'm grabbing, I'm waiting for you to move me. I want you to make, you know, make me want to put this, build this scene around you, you know, something that's going to tell the story. Um, so that's the way I do it. I just try to, because I always assume my first reaction is the way that a viewer might have its, their first reaction to the same material. And when you start cutting together, it might not piece together for certain reasons, either matching or it doesn't match where you want to go with the, the tone of the scene. But that's the way that I, that I do it. Yeah, I always take notes when I watch the well, when I watch the dailies and and find the. I'm always looking for that key moment in the scene that the scene hinges on, and sometimes you look it's you look at all the coverage and you might think, oh, you would want to be in a close up for that or a wide shot for that. But at the end of the day, it's really about where the best piece of performance is, and whether that's in a wide shot, an over, a close, whatever it is. And once you find that moment that emotionally the scene hinges on, then I'll kind of work backwards from that and design the scene around it. Because sometimes that key, that incredible line reading, is in a wide shot. And so then you want to design the scene and cut it so that it, it feels natural to be in a wide shot at that moment. So I'm just looking for, and I take notes about, you know, what works for this line and what works for that line. And then I have all those notes that I can look at, but I also have the dailies that I can look at. Again, and you do go back to the dailies time and again. Um, it's useful to know what your first reaction was, because your first impression all, uh, tells you a lot about uh, what's really working. Go ahead, Monty. Yeah. Um, whether a scene has two people, or it's a dinner scene with six people, or it's a conference scene with ten people, uh, generally one person is kind of leading the scene, and there may be two or three other people uh, interacting with them, and the rest of the people are more reactors. Uh, but when we get our dailies, there may be a two-shot of a person who doesn't have a line in the scene. And when I'm looking at those performances, they're as important to me as the people who have lines because they inform me of, are they buying what's being said? Are they opposed to it? Does it strike them as funny? And this tells the audience what subtext is going on in the scene. So I was just recently working on a show with three lead actors who were all really, really good actors. And two of the actors were fabulous reactors. When, when the camera is on them and they don't have a line for minutes on end, you can tell what's going on reading their face. It's fascinating. You can just turn it on and watch them. <laughs> the third actor would stop acting and wait for his lines. So I need to cut to him. I need to get his, it's going to inform the audience what he's feeling and what the scene's about. So when we're watching our dailies, we're looking for what we react to, and we're also looking for all of that emotional information that's not in the, you know, that's not dialogue. And um, sometimes when we're marking or writing notes, it's, it's in response to people's reaction to what's going on. And so I, I can't emphasize how much, how valuable that is to us. Oh, I totally agree. I completely cut for subtext like Monty was saying. I mean, there's sort of a tenant that we're supposed to cut dialogue on camera. So if you're saying it, your face is on the camera is sort of a general rule of thumb. But, um, but I don't really care what's being said. I care what it means underneath it all. And so I have recut entire scenes that another editor had where they cut it perfectly fine for the dialogue. And they absolutely, in my mind, missed, missed the entire scene. Because the scene wasn't about what was being said. It was about everything else underneath it. Um, and that is in the reactions of the characters that aren't speaking. And so you're, I think your hardest work as actors is those moments when you have to be present 
and listening. And those are the most exciting moments for me as an editor to grab onto when I'm cutting. I, I think that um, I take a lot of notes when, I, when I'm watching the dailies and they're probably fairly indecipherable to anybody else who, who is to look at them. They make sense to me though and, and what I'm always looking for is, uh, is, is that one take where an actor really got it and you, you know it when you see it and I think you guys know it when you do it where you feel like you were firing on all cylinders, you hit the right beats, you had an arc in your performance, you were really connected and, and listening to what the other actor was saying and reacting, and, and you were believable. And when I see that performance, I put a bunch of asterisks next to it in my Avid, and I try to build the scene out of those performances. And, and what's interesting is that the best take for one actor there may be two people on camera and it's not the best take for the f actor number one, but it's clearly the best take for actor number two. And then there's a different performance which is clearly the best take for actor number one. So you gotta figure out a way to edit the scene so you can use the best part of both of those. But I, I'm always looking for that money take and then, like Lisa, I try to construct my scene around it and make sure that that's what I hit. Um, but I think it's, uh, like, one of the advantages that we have when we're editing is that uh, we can rewind it infinitely and the more you work on a scene the more you start thinking about it and the more we start drilling down and I think a lot of the homework that the actors do before they arrive on the set we're doing as we're watching the dailies and we're watching it and, and somebody does something and you say oh that's interesting I wonder why she did oh she's reacting because of this and because of that and it plays into this that's a great moment I think I got to use that and so uh, we're always watching everything that you're doing like way down to the very minute level and another thing that we're looking for is like every single little reaction to everything that's happening. So if somebody says something to you that irritates you, then, we, then when we watch your dailies, we're looking for the shot that shows the irritation. And then you respond and then the other character gets offended and so then we, we're looking for that little bit of, of you know, sh that shows offended. And you know, you sort of ping pong back and forth but if the actors aren't really listening and connecting with each other, then they're not gonna be reacting appropriately. And generally there's gonna be at least one take where the subtext is really there and they're really reacting to what's actually happening. And that's, for me, is like that's the building block, that's the foundation of everything that I'm gonna try to build in the scene. And on the other hand, if it's not there, then we are not above stealing. <laughs> Which means we will take it from anywhere in, in any of your coverage. We will grab something that approximates the look that we want and we'll use it, even though you never intended it for that portion of the scene. And you roll it backwards? I, I have rolled backwards. I have rolled takes backwards to get a look on an actor's face that I wanted. I know I've done that too. <laughs> the, the other thing that I am notorious for, sorry guys, I, is um, you know, we don't just cut one take. We'll cut between the takes to get the right reactions, of course. But I will put words in your mouth. If I like your face in a take, what your eyes are doing, but I don't like the way you inflected your words, I will find them from another take and I will shove them in your mouth and make them sink. And it works. We do it all the time. It all the time. Works. I don't think I don't think that's dirty pool either. It's the it's the same Fair actor's game. face, it's the same actor's voice. But it, but it's also not not everybody gets everything in one take. I find some actors I'm taking something from this take and that take and that other take and it doesn't make as long as I get the performance that works in the end, I don't think it matters how you get to it. You know what I mean? If you have one take that's perfect, well that's great, but not everybody is like that. So we're looking at everything and taking all the pieces and building it the way that it needs to be built. Because sometimes it's also the case that in the moment you think, and even the director thinks, that this is the performance that you need. It needs to be angry, it needs to be sad, whatever it needs to be. And after you look at the scene all the way through, or the show all the way through, you realize you need to be less angry, or it's the wrong emotion. So you have to go back and try to build it from other takes and piece it together and find that balance of emotion that you need to make the scene work. And I think it sounds like it's a little less pressure from because you have multiple takes and you guys can do the work of like, this section was great in this take and this section was great in this take. It's a little less pressure on the actor to go, okay, I have to be A plus from moment one to the end of the scene all in one take. Yeah, I mean, 
mean, as long as I have every line reading one time, I don't care how many takes it, ta it is for me to get to it, as long as it's there. And if we have to build it, sometimes you're just trading out words here and there. It's part of the, it's part of the craft, and uh, you know, I think everybody takes a lot of pride in the fact that, that we can do it. Yeah, and we want to make you look the best you possibly can, so that's what we're sitting in there doing. We're trying to make the performances be the most wonderful performances we can possibly get out of the footage that we have in front of us. And yeah, we're happy to do it. I also like to, because we always think of an editor as a very technical job, and it is in, in various degrees, but also your, your first pass is an emotional connection and an emotional through line, and I feel that's very interesting that that's, that's where you guys start. And um, this actually goes to a question um, from Tiffany of like, um, Tiffany Cox, are you here? It's Tiffany, hey Tiffany. What led you to this work? Did you guys come from a performance background? Was it all, did you, were, did you guys know you wanted to be editors from day one? Can I talk about a little bit of like, were you using your experience to have an emotional connection, technical experience, all those good things? Um, my story's a little funny with that. Basically, the first time I ever realized I wanted to do film was cutting reel to reel in college. I was, it was the first time that the clock, you know, six hours passed and I didn't realize that that was happening. But when I got to LA, I was like, oh, I don't want to be an editor. That's way too technical. Forget it. Like, I'm just going to be a writer or whatever. I'm, I don't want to have to learn all the computer stuff. It's going to change every three years. And um, I got hurt on set, actually, on a commercial. And I was declared physically unable to return to work. And the state of California had to, it was a workman's comp. They trained me. They were like, well, we can train you in another profession. And I was like, I don't want another profession. And they said, well, you can go to editing school, which is AVID classes. And so I actually learned the AVID from going to that program. And that's how I became an editor. So, And then I definitely have always felt comfortable editing. I've always enjoyed it. But I was a little intimidated by the technical side of it when I was very young. But I don't feel that it's a technical thing. I mean, we know how to work a computer really well. Um, we know how to do things quickly because we've done it so many times. And but. It's all about feeling, it's all about emotion, reaction, and my, whenever I work with Shonda, she's like, editors are writers. She's like, editors are writers as much as my writers are. You know, when, we get in the, when she gets in the bay, that's what we're doing. And she's, she told me if she wasn't a writer, she'd be an editor. So that's how I feel. We're, we're the last line of defense. You know, when the script didn't work out, <laughs> or somebody was sick on set, we gotta pull that story together, so. I actually think the technical part is the least important part of my job. For technical questions, I go straight to my assistant or to one of our, our post supervisors or somebody. I'm not that good at the technical side of it. I know how to work my computer and do everything I need on the computer. But I, my background, I was a ballet dancer before I was a film editor. <laughs> and I, I actually think it was a good training because it's all about responding to the moment and, and, and I mean certainly editing is very rhythmical so you have to have a good sense of rhythm for it but um, and certainly a good sense of storytelling but uh, it's more about it's not about the technical part I think almost anybody can teach anybody to push the buttons um, I don't know if you can if you count high school musicals as a performance background Sure, but I, all of you guys got past that, but I didn't, because my range was like angry or not angry, and <laughs> that's it. And uh, when I was at film school, I, I had a similar experience where uh, on a winter vacation, I stayed uh, in, in the city to cut my movie, and like the day would go by, and I wouldn't even realize it because I was so lasered in on the detail, and, and I just really liked all the detail work. Um, and I think that also I came from a very technical background and so I enjoyed the challenge when everything shifted to computers. I felt very comfortable on computers and it was a very natural feel for me. Um, but it is, it is very difficult to keep up with the technology and to know all of the ins and outs of it. And at a certain point, when you're in the editing, ch when you're in the assistance chair, that's uh, like the number one priority for your job is to be on top of all the technical stuff so that the editor can focus on the creative stuff. And then when you're the editor, you need to be able to let go of the technical stuff to focus on the creative and the emotional aspect of it and, and let your assistant, who's probably younger and their brain is more facile now with all the technology than you are, 
be able to figure out all of the, the technical stuff that you need. Because really what you need to be, at the end of the day, is a storyteller and you need to be able to analyze what's working and what's not working and how do you get from where you are now to where you want to be and what are the, the what puzzle solving can you do to take the pieces that you've got and reassemble, re-scramble to create new meaning. You know, editing is, is one plus one equals three. And, and so that's a lot of what we do. I um, started out as a visual artist, and as a kid and into my entire adult, adult life, I'm an avid reader, I love stories. And in graduate school, one of my um, friends came in with her paints in film canisters. And I said, what do you do? And she said, I work in editorial. And I said, when we get out of school, I want you to get me a job in editorial. I had no idea what it was. <laughs> and that, I, I really literally had no idea what an editor did, nothing. My eight-year-old knows more than I did at the time. And I got a job in editing. And the thing about editing for me, I'm somebody, I'm a puzzle solver. I'll sit there with a, you know, the, the jewelry box filled with the necklaces that are all bunched up. And I'll sit there for hours until they're all straightened out. And sitting in the editing chair, the day will go by in five minutes. The back of the room, it's like watching paint dry. It's so boring when you're behind the editor. But when you are the editor cutting those scenes, it's very exciting. And I feel like it's magic. So I'm like a magician every day. I have literally created scenes that didn't exist. <laughs> One time I told the executive producer, the girls are coming in from a basketball game and they're dejected because they just lost, but we didn't see the game. We need to shoot a scene where we see at least them losing. The, you know, the, the, the scoreboard going up and that they lost and then they come in and he says we don't have the money for that we can't do it you have to create it I was like out of what and I had to take practice scrimmages that these girls had been you know um, practice games that they had and somehow create a game with the board and, and I did it I made a 30 second scene out of nothing and when he saw it he said it was way better than it had any right to be and now cut it down to 12 seconds <laughs> And I've been asked to take a three minute scene where people are walking all over the room and somehow cut a minute and a half out of it. And they're never in the same place. And I've done it. So I am a magician <laughs> and I love it. I was a history and economics major in college. So, and I, I was born and raised in New York City. I knew nobody in the entertainment business. Nobody I knew knew anybody in the entertainment business. And so it wasn't real to be into it. But uh, I came out to California and a friend of mine, his mother was working at Paramount and said, I can get you a job as a page at ABC. What do pages do? <laughs> they put on a uniform and they let people into the audiences and so on and so forth. So I became a page and the, the and, ABC had a film department at the time, and I interviewed for it and got it. And we're all in the Editor's Guild. And the Guild is, as Guild started from the medieval times, for editors, it's still that way. There are apprentices, then there are assistants, then you become an editor. And at each stage of the, the learning process, you don't have to go to film school to go through this process. You're learning it on the job. And that's how it was for me. I had no knowledge about what editing was. It seemed very mysterious and difficult. Um, and the first show I worked on as an assistant was MacGyver. And my editor let me cut a scene where it was a wide shot where a guy gets out of a car and a close shot of him getting out of the car. So I cut that. And I looked at it for an hour. I was like, he got out of the car. I buy it. <laughs> um, I thought when I was at this stage of my career, that was 1987, I thought by the time I'm at this stage of my career, I would be totally confident in what I do and always know how to approach scenes. And I would say 70% of the time, 75% of the time, that is true. But one of the reasons I've gone to a lot of shows is I like to be scared. I like to, oh my God, how am I going to do that? Uh, I had some fight scenes in Daredevil that I got 10 hours of dailies. So I was swamped with, and how am I going to make something out of this? So sometimes, uh, for me, 
when I'm looking at dailies and I'm looking at performances of actors, sometimes the thing that will make me click that is, I don't know what that is, and why is he doing that? And rather than rejecting it, it's very stimulating to me of, could this be something? And, um, and the flip side of that, I did a pilot with F. Murray Abrams, and he comes to a door, and just before he opens the door, he says, uh, he's a very mundane line like, is anybody home? And he said it four times. They were radically different, each one. And I spent a good 45 minutes trying to pick one of them because they were all fabulous, and they all were different. And uh, I would suggest if you're doing a scene and you do get to do multiple takes, that you do take a chance on at least one of them and really dig in a different direction uh, because sometimes that stimulates us, it stimulates the producers. It may not have been in anybody's mind what that scene was about, but it could unlock something, so. I was gonna, um, I wanna piggyback on that and the idea, because we talked about how you can, since you're cutting from different takes, you can each actor can do something a little differently in each take, and sometimes they think of that, sometimes a director wants them to do it. Can you give kind of context around how is that beneficial when you guys are putting the scenes together? Is it sometimes because directors maybe don't know which one they want yet, and we're still just trying to figure that out? Can you guys talk a little bit about that experience with that? Yeah, you know, uh, the director's trying to get a range of performances uh, because, you know, they're not shooting everything in sequence. So they're shooting scene 20, before they shoot scene 19, and scene 20 might be a continuation of 19. And so they're not sure yet how angry the characters are gonna get at the end of 19. So when they walk in the door, pretending they didn't just have a fight because everybody at dinner will know in scene 20, like how much should their anger have been up there, you know, like to connect them. So they may get a range of performances. They also may be saying to themselves, I'm not entirely certain if this scene should play really hot or if it should play really cold or really intense, what exactly, they're, you know, they're trying to figure out how to calibrate it. So they're doing that in the moment, and they're also trying to use one actor to do a little more pinch, so the other actor gives a little more ouch, uh, to try to ramp each other up or cool each other down. And what's good for us is that we can cut the scene and we can say, well, I've got three takes, and I can see that this, this actor gets progressively angrier from take to take. So. Uh, we don't want them to be angry for the entire scene or else they don't have anywhere to go. So I'm going to use the first take for the first third where they're the least angry. And then I'm going to go to the second take for the middle third and then the last third when they're white hot napalm angry for the end. And that will be a really good progression. And the act that then the character's got an arc and all the performances are there. And then we might send the show, the director may love it or the director may say, well, you know, I really wish that they didn't get white hot napalm at any point because they're gonna get white hot napalm six scenes later. That's where I want the anger to really blow. So uh, <coughs> can you recut this with the performance where it's less? So then we go, oh, okay, well I got three, so I can use the other one where it was less for this. And so you can sort of calibrate on the emotional scale when there's a range of performances. When every performance is the same, then you don't really have anything to work with. Then it's just a question of, you know, well, which one was he looking in the right direction? or which one did he blink at the right time or whatever. But if you've got a range of performances, then you can do interesting stuff and you can play with the idea that a certain idea in the script is more important to this character than the other ideas and so that's where they get really emotional or that's where they have their turn or whatever the moment it is that you wanna play. But if you don't have a lot of different colors, then everything's gonna come out the same color and it's not gonna be interesting. And something kind of jumping on what he was saying there, and this goes for people with smaller parts as well. Like for instance, I was cutting this scene and the vice president goes to this burger place and it's the first time she's ever been to the burger place. And so they're ordering and the guy doing the order, his only lines were, welcome, let me take your order. But the reactions that he was having were so funny and so interesting that the director goes, oh, I love that. And so she jumped on it. And as soon as I saw it, I jumped on it. And we start designing that scene because his excitement is showing how big of a deal it is that the vice president is getting a burger in this burger place. And none of that's in the script. And he took that chance. And obviously, the director could have said, hey, chill out. This isn't about you. But 
I'm so happy she didn't because it made the scene for me. And then that's the thing. It's the things that aren't on the page sometimes are what are the little gems that make it worth editing because you're like, oh, I can build this whole thing and it's going to say everything about what the scene is about without saying it at all. Um, let's talk a little bit about the, the directors and, and, and showruns. Let's first talk about directors. You got the first rough cut. You, you, you feel like you're ready, to, you're giving it to the director. You said you, it's all you work with just directors for days or is it a little different? That's one question. Then two, what's those conversations you're having with the directors? What's the notes that are beginning? What are they talking about with actors? Good, bad, all those kind of things. Well, one thing about working with the director for those four days is that nobody else is allowed to see the cut before the director signs off on it. And the reason for that is that the director has a legal right and also, I think, a moral right to be able to present a vision of the show the way they intended it to be. And so the Directors Guild says the editor's cut can't go to anybody except for the director. Once the director has gone through and had their time to make the changes, you know, within the four required days. They can't take 30 days to work on it or else our schedule falls apart. But once they've done their four days, only then can it go to the writers or the producers or anybody else involved with the show. Because it protects the directors against the possibility that I'm terrible at my job and I only pick the takes where the burger guy was doing the most ridiculous over the top stuff and then I cut to the vice president and he had cheese on his face or whatever. And then, I sh and then the showrunner comes by and says, hey, show me that burger scene. I heard it came out really great. And I go, yeah, it's awesome. And I show it and it's like, it's atrocious. And then they say, thanks, thanks, Jordan. And then they leave the room and they say, I got to fire that director. That director screwed the scene up so badly. They're going to screw up the rest of the show. It's two o'clock on the East Coast. If I fire them now, I could have somebody there by four. Like, they don't want any of that to happen. They want a chance to quality check their work before the, direct, before the showrunner gets a chance to see it. So when you're with the director for those four days, it's like closed doors, it's Vegas, what happens in the room stays in the room, which is actually true for editorial like the whole way through. We're very much the keeper of everybody's secrets. You know, we see all of the actors' performances and the actors are very vulnerable on camera and we keep confidence by not running up and down the halls and yelling like, look at the stupid thing they did, you know, like. <laughs> We want to honor their work and, and like actors, when they experiment, they're experimenting in front of the camera and you have to respect that they're being vulnerable and they're taking a chance and it's not always 100% going to be great. And so, okay, that's, you know, that's why that take wasn't chosen as one of the great takes for this performance. Um, so when you're with the director, the, one of the big things that the director is going to do usually is they're going to experiment with performances and they're going to say things like, I don't want them to be this hot this early or, you know, let's not use the take where she cries, let's use the take where she's holding it back more. Or they may completely change the cutting pattern around and say, you know, I want to start on the close-up of the microphone, and then we reveal the audience, unlike what you did, which is to show the audience and then go to the microphone. Or they may say, I have a whole plan for this fight scene. Uh, I meant to call you, but I didn't have a chance. Uh, I wanted to start with a club hitting the head, and you go, Oh, well, if the club hits the head, that means that this and that and this, and then like the dominoes all fall and you got, you, it's a completely different way to approach the scene, which is totally valid. And that's kind of a lot of the fun of being an editorial is that there's a thousand ways to solve the puzzle and make it the most interesting thing you can. And some directors walk in, I think, with like this golden key because they've got a whole plan in their head that they may not have had the opportunity to communicate to you. And then once they do, you go, oh, that's what, the, that's what your intention for the scene is really about. The subtext I thought was about this. You think it's really about this. The tone meaning wasn't super clear. And this is what you made, so this is what we're gonna go for. And, and so there's always interesting things that happen in those four days. It's really fun. I love, I love working, I love working on my own, like quiet in my own little dark room. And then I love it when the directors come in and the producers as well and work on their vision of the show because because you do see th things in a brand new way and it is, it's very exciting to get out of your own head and see someone else's creative vision. And I've been on both sides of it. I also have come in with a storyboard and told the editor when I directed, this, this is what I want. And I, was set, I sat there, when he says this, be on this shot. When she says this, be on this shot. I mean, I was a pain in the ass. I would have hated me if I was the editor of me. Um, but, but it's really, um, it is really exciting to be able to work with that other professional. Having worked on a, a, a varied amount of shows and varied in quality, um, the directors do by contract get four days. 
uh, often they get pushed out of one of those days. The producer will say, we're in a jam, we, we really, could you just do two days? And if they want to keep working on the show and be team players, they often agree to it. Um, the majority of the directors we work with are journeyman directors. That is to say, they're not attached to the show. They'll be going from scandal to the next show to the next show. And uh, we don't have, a, my experience is editors don't have a lot of communication with them prior to uh, act, them actually being in the room. So when they come in the room is when we really get a sense of what they're about and what they want. Um, my experience in television is many producers are like, we're glad that we got that jerk out of the room, now we really get to work. Um, but in fact, those four days spent with the director definitely helped the show get better. Um, just having another person look, look at it. Everybody who looks at a show, it gets better and better as it goes through the iterations. Um, but the directors, they do their four days, and once they're gone, the producers can totally recut their work, or often, I, I just worked with a producer who, he loved directors, he respected what they did, but he didn't think they really understood story. So he, if, in his mind, good directors got you good material, and you, the producer shapes what that is. That goes back to old Hollywood feature idea. And he was a really good editor. That is to say, he did have a really great sense of story. So his directors, and he tried to get the best directors, uh, he wasn't interested in what they thought was important in any particular scene or any sequence. And that's unusual, but that's not unheard of. So uh, our relationship with the directors, if we're on a show for a number of seasons, Jordan's been on Homeland for a number of years, Lisa's been on House of Cards for a number of years, they tend to then bring back certain directors that they like, and then you get to work with them. Then, then the shorthand begins, then you understand what their tastes are, and they get who you are, and um, that's when it really gets to be enjoyable because you, you have a working relationship. On House of Cards, it's, it's, I've never had this experience on another show, but we try to keep the directors involved all the way through to the end. And that was something that David Fincher set up in the beginning because he's a director. And uh, oftentimes, the producers and the editor know the show better than the director because the director's a guest and they don't all come back. Sometimes they're just there for their one or two episodes and then they're moving on to something else. But they do have a, a very specific point of view, and I think that their involvement in it makes for the show better in the end. Um, but uh, very often the directors just kind of, sometimes on some shows I've worked on, they barely even do their days because they're just off onto the next show. And, uh, and it is the editor and the producers that know the show better and can craft the cut to fit the, to fit the template of what our show really is. And when we've been on a show for a while, we can be an advocate for the overall show. And so that's something that we can do as we collaborate with the director, is discuss that with them and, and shape the show with them in a direction that we know the show is going to ultimately be going in anyway. So often we advocate for a certain way of doing or, right? Yeah, it's also helpful to be able to say, uh, you know, you may not remember, but eight episodes ago, yeah. this guy cheated up with that person's girlfriend. And so that's one of the things that's playing in the scene. So I think maybe we should be on that character a little more and the director will be like, uh, yeah, that's that, I meant that. <laughs> but you can help them along because you probably know the history of the story and the characters a little better. And you also have a very clear sense of visual, the visual style of the show. You know, all of the episodes should essentially look like they are part of the same story and they should generally look the same. You don't want to have a, a huge visual distinction between episodes of a serialized drama. Like for something like Twilight Zone, it's fine for everything to look totally different because they're all totally different stories, but every episode of Homeland should look like an episode of Homeland. And for that reason, there's a, there's a person on the crew who's the producing director. The producing director is the director who is always on set uh, or always on the location, and their job is to be like the uber 
director. And so when the, the journeyman director comes, who's just going to do one or two episodes that season, they say, hi, welcome to the show. Here's how we do the show. This is the visual style of the show. These are uh, some of the things that you should know about our actors and about our location and about our crew. And they have generally a very strong relationship with the actors because they're there the whole time. And the producing director usually shoots the premiere episode and the finale and one or two in the middle. Um, and so the producer and director, along with the DP, it's their part of their responsibility is to ensure sort of a visual continuity of the style of the show. One other thing is, that's interesting is also the director doesn't know what's going to happen in the next episode. So like I had this scene where, well, I got the scene where the president got shot and when they first shot it, um, it looked like heat. It was like crazy, all these awesome angles, and it was like one of the coolest things they ever cut, and the director was like, let's go in slow motion, let's do this, let's do that. And then when we cut it, it's like, oh, that has to happen in three seconds, like, because in the next episode, you find out this. And it was a remote control, like a remote controlled gun, so you don't have time for all this to happen. So although the director was obsessed with all of that stuff, it didn't serve the story. Mm -hmm. So you end up, you know, turn it into five shots. Help a director out and at least give them a hint, man. That was, <laughs> that should have been addressed in tone. Well, I don't think they knew either, you know <laughs> what I mean? It's just like, that was how the next story came out, so. Yeah, and that's, and that's interesting too with the, how a uh, season ends versus the next season and how you have to leave some things. Um, let's go into showrunners and conversations with showrunners like you guys have talked about initially. They're the ones that are kind of the final say, and they're the, they're the boss of, of the show and everything, and they know the story, and they have the long-term view. So what are the conversations you're having with them specifically? Is it just story? Is it, do you get nitty-gritty with, with performances? Kind of um, open the door a little bit to those conversations. My, my low-ball goal in the editing room is to never make it worse. And that sounds so stupid, but I mean it. Like sometimes you get a note and the note seems like it's gonna make it worse. I'm not saying the showrunners are giving me this note, but any time in the process, I always try to at least leave it as good as it is or make it better. And so sometimes if I can't address a note that a showrunner is asking for, I'll, think, I'll ask them what the spirit of the note is. I can't give you a close up here because I don't have it. The spirit of the note is that you really want that to have impact, that line. Okay, so let's find another way around that. So, and we are talking story. We are, uh, on a lot of the shows I've been on, it's true, we are the, we are the third set of writers. And, and I was really happy on Switch to Birth, for instance, that they trusted me enough to yank dialogue. I was the one that was able to pull out, you know, when we were eight minutes over, they'd say, get us down to two minutes over, we'll see you in a couple days. And that meant that I was in charge of the story. Now, they might come in and say, eh, no, you went too far, you gotta put this back in. But they gave me the first initial pass, and the first thing I took out was exposition and answering questions that nobody really asked, um, which is sort of an exposition thing too, I guess. So we are true collaborators, and, and, but the showrunner, it's their show, it's their baby, it's their responsibility. And so I always, always, always um, try to address the note. I, have, I, I do not say no. Even if I think it's boneheaded in my head, I will try it. I won't say that out loud. And I've also learned that 90% of the time it can work. So stop, stop my own head from saying no and try that note. See what they're going for. Um, you know, they're, they're smart, responsible people. The showrunner's job is the hardest job I've ever seen. And I don't think I've ever seen anybody who seems to be enjoying their time. <laughs> so what I really try to do is make their life easier. And if you have a good relationship with them and they can tell you what's wrong, what needs to be addressed, I don't need them to tell me how to fix the problem, but just articulate what's not working. And then I want to do my best to find a way to do it and just not be one more problem for the showrunner because there's probably a problem on the set and a problem with camera and a problem with the latest script. So if we can solve the problems, I mean, a good editor, it's like why, why you get asked back to a show, because you can solve the problems without having the producer have to hold your hand through it. Yeah, that's the funny thing is, um, yeah, you're exactly right. And if your showrunner is doing multiple, multiple shows, the notes can be as vague as just fix it <laughs> to, um, you know, the way I like it. <laughs> 
And so that's just one of those things where you're like, yeah, I do. Okay, let's do it, you know. Um, but, the, yeah, the show, it's all about the show. We talk about everything. We talk about everything. We talk about, okay, we wanted this to be this, but it's not. How are we going to fix it? It's, this is the story we want to tell. We can't tell that story, so what story are we going to tell? What do we want to focus on? What do, how do we want to, you know, what's the best version of a, of a television show we can make out of this? That's the big thing that I've learned from showrunners is a lot of writers, when they'll get in the bay with you, they'll be like, oh, my script, I meant it to be this. I meant it to be that. And a great showrunner will be like, well, that's not working, so let's make it this. Let's make it that. Let's craft something that works. Because at the end of the day, we got to get something on air. One of the conversations that I like having with showrunners is if I think that there's an actor who's doing something really interesting, I like to point it out. And I like to hear what the showrunner thinks is an interesting thing. And you know, we'll sit in the room sometimes and coo together over this amazing thing that Claire did in a take or somebody else did. And there have been times, you know, you, you want to sort of choose your battles wisely with the showrunners, but there have been times where they've wanted to cut out some dialogue that really we don't need or an intro to a scene or a reaction shot. And sometimes if the, if the actor is doing something really interesting, I'll try to stick up and say, well, you know, I know we don't really need this moment, but I just find this guy totally fascinating. Is it possible that we could keep this in and maybe on the next pass we could get rid of him if we don't find a way to save this five seconds that we have to cut out here? You know, let's cut five seconds out somewhere else, but like, can we try to keep this guy for now? Because I just think he's really neat. And I think something that actors may not realize is that we are advocating for you when you're doing stuff that's interesting, we notice when you're doing stuff that's believable and real and cool and really speaks to us, then we're gonna fight for you in the cutting room. If other people aren't responding to it, we, some of us are responding to it, and we're gonna try to advocate for you. And sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. Um, you know, there's usually deleted scenes on DVDs, on the box sets, and you can watch those and, and see some of the stuff that got cut out. But you know, there's there's an issue of time always on these shows. On uh, on on Showtime, we have at most like 55 to 58 minutes of Showtime. Uh, showtime, Showtime. We have 55 to 58 minutes of Homeland that we can do, and, and the rest of that time is allocated. On network, you have like 42 minutes of show, and the rest is all for commercials. And the commercials are funding the show. So if you're going to eat into the time that's allocated for commercials, the network's not going to be very happy about that because that's where they're making their money. So you have to get your show to time. That's what you, you call it. You say it's to time. So generally an editor's cut is going to be long you know it could be anywhere from five minutes to ten minutes to like even more if there's all kinds of stuff happening in the show and then the director comes in and they generally get it within i would say like five minutes over and then the showrunner will come in when the, once the showrunner gets involved they start getting it down to time but I, I like getting the note from the showrunner when i get worried about the time and i raise a flag about it i'm often told just make the best show that you can and we'll get it down to time later, which is very empowering, and I like that a lot. But at the end of the day, it's always going to happen. You've got to get the show down to time. And when you start doing that, that's when you start cutting out lines of dialogue that are nice, but honestly not necessary. You're going to cut entrances into scenes. You're going to cut exits out of scenes. You're going to cut the ticket taker and just start the scene with everybody sitting in the theater already. And it's not necessarily because the actors are bad. It's because you, you're over. And you need that time for the big argument between the couple that are the leads in the in the show, you want to milk that. You want that five minute scene to be five minutes. You don't want to cut 30 seconds out of that scene. You got to cut 30 seconds out of something else because that's the money scene that this show is really about. And so a lot of people wind up on the floor because they had a small part that was ultimately expendable. It doesn't necessarily mean that you did a poor job. It just means we had to get to time. Yeah, and always, I think we would always rather cut out lines of dialogue and entrances and ex exits and cut out exposition um, rather than cut out the nuances of a performance within a scene. Because your other choice is just to tighten everything up where everybody's talking on top of each other and it works in an argument but it doesn't work in an emotional, some, the real dramatic scenes. And so if you want to preserve that space between the words, if you want to preserve that subtlety of acting, then you have to be ruthless in some other area. Um, let's jump into a little bit of um, detailed craft stuff. You mentioned the, um, um, the actor who worked at the Burger Place. Um, when have you seen actors 
um, used restraint well and not used restraint well. Because we a lot of times as actors, you hear as a guest star, the co-star, it's not about you, it's about the lead. But yet this actor made something of that and didn't take away. So when have you guys seen that work? And when you're like, oh, okay, they should have shown restraint here and they didn't. Um, well, I, I think you see it all the time. Um, whether an actor is, I mean, a good, like for instance, you might have an instinct to cry. You think if I cry, then they're gonna love this and they're gonna put it on because it's so super emotional and it's gonna be awesome. And then the note I always get is, does it say in the script to cry? No. Then why are they crying? Because it's awesome. Look at how they're crying. It's so, but it's not in the script. So if you could do one crying take and then not the rest, that's perfect. But do you see what I'm saying? It's just like, if you go too far with it, if you want to make a meal, like I knew an actor once, he was having, he, he was getting frustrated with the amount of material he was getting. So he was like, hey, can you put those drops in my eyes so I can cry? And our producer director was like, dude, you're like bringing in the lunch, like relax, it doesn't make any sense. So that's, uh, when you're on an ensemble, you have to be patient, I think sometimes, and you have to wait until you get your turn. And um, I don't know if that answered. But. I would say, you know, you have to be aware of what the scene is really about and who the scene is really about and not pull focus when it's not your scene. And when you're at the beginning of your career and you're getting smaller parts and you don't have a whole lot to do, it sometimes can be tempting to try to make something much, much bigger out of your part in an effort to have people notice you. But you don't want to get noticed for the wrong reason. So I think if you're in a smaller part, you just got to remember what, who the show is really about and just be a real believable person in this situation and let the main characters do their thing and, and just live on in the moment. And I think also in terms of just performance and, and when to push it and when not to, like crying is the perfect example. And anger is a great example too. Uh, you know, we'll often, we'll, we'll always get the takes in where people are crying and the waterworks are coming and it's just a lot. And I think it's a, a natural thing for emotional people to want to cry, but we rarely, rarely use those takes because the ones where people are trying not to cry are always so much more interesting. When someone's trying to keep it together and not let the other people know how much it really upsets them and they're just really fighting it, like that's always so much more interesting than, than the person who's you know pulling their hair out and beating their breast and yelling and screaming and, and the tears and the snot and all that. Like there's a time for that, like once, but you can't do that every episode. You can't do that every scene. Like that's the big money payoff at the end of your movie. And even then, it's often better if it's just really quiet and restrained. Like, does, any, does anybody seen the movie Love Actually? Yeah. Okay, so does everybody remember the scene where um, she gets the CD from her husband for Christmas? And she thought it was gonna be the expensive jewelry that she saw him. And then, so she goes upstairs and she puts the music on and she starts crying. It's Emma Thompson and it's just, it's devastating. And when she's crying, like she's not screaming and moaning and throwing herself on the bed and kicking up a storm. It's just the tears, they just come and you're right there with her and you know exactly what's going on. And, and it's also because she's being really specific. One of the things that can go wrong when you're doing a scene where you're crying is if you're not specific about what exactly is causing the crying, then it becomes harder for the audience to interpret. You know, we're always trying to give signposts to the audience of why the character is doing what they're doing and why they feel this way and what that makes happen next. And if you're crying and you don't specifically know why you're crying, you just feel like crying, it doesn't really serve the story well. If you're crying because your brother always does this to you, he always tells you that your opinion doesn't matter and, and you just can't handle it anymore and that makes you start crying, the audience is gonna pick up on that and they're gonna know why and it's gonna help the story. So if you're gonna go for the waterworks, you gotta be really specific but I think a wise move for most actors in most scenes is to not go big on the waterworks. And, and with anger, a lot of times, instead of the big angry yelling stuff, it always becomes very interesting when we get anger that's delivered really quiet and really in, like this. Terrifying. That's scary. That's, like, that's a really angry person. And, and it's often more impactful than the guy who goes ballistic and has the crazy fit. And you can give the director both. And then when we're in the cutting room, we can choose. So like, again, that's where the variation in performances helps us because 
maybe that was the right time to be the crazy, ballistic, abusive, drunk husband instead of being the deadly killer who speaks this stuff, you know? Um, when I was a page at ABC, one of the directors on a show I worked on as a, as a page uh, said, Monty, if you want to get in this business, you got to know everything about the business. You should try acting. And I had no experience acting. I had no desire to act. Or, and I said, why would I want to do that? So if you become a producer or a director or somebody else, you know what their process is and you know what they... So he and his wife uh, had an acting class at the Fountain Theater and they said, come on down, we'll give you half price. Good, I'll, I'll do it. And I went down. And that's where I got tremendous respect for what you do. The courage it takes to be an actor, the ability to access your emotions, I found out I could not do it. <laughs> and, but in the process of learning that I couldn't do it, I learned what you guys do and how important courage is because it's your face that's gonna be up on the television screen or the big screen, not ours. Um, because this is about TV, I wanna suggest that if any of you are fortunate enough to be on a television show as a, a regular or a recurring character in any kind of way, that you uh, bond with one of the producers such that you can get an opportunity to get into the cutting room. Because what you do is like you do your work and then you know, the next time you see it, if you see it, it's, it's on television, but you don't know how those decisions were made to get you there. And I say that because working on regular shows, actors are people, people do things by habit, all of us, and there are certain habits that certain actors have that I wish somebody would just tell them, you know, put your head up when you say those lines, or don't look this way, whatever. And I'm like frustrated because it's not my job to go down on set and pull an actor over and say, do, don't, whatever, but I, would love to. Uh, uh, I would love to have them just watch their dailies. And I think even just watching their dailies without being um, instructed or my opinion given, you would see certain things. So the point of this is if there's an opportunity for you to get in the cutting room and there's an editor you trust or a producer you trust or whatever, um, have them show you what your work looks like and then kind of like why we chose this and that. And if it's an ongoing thing, what we love, this is what's working, this is what's not working. Um, that I think could be, it would take courage to hear that, but I think it would be tremendously invaluable. That's funny because I spent the summer in acting class this summer and I, it was unbelievably difficult and I really was like, why does anyone choose to do this? <laughs> I am very emotionally guarded. I think that's why I sit in a dark room all day. Um, so I have so much respect for actors. And what was interesting was when you, what they would tell the actors is like, okay, go to this point, get to the point where you want to cry. Now pull it back. Now stay in that space. Now be there. Now do the scene. And I would watch these actors destroy themselves you know, tear themselves down to build themselves back up. I was like, what, you're paying for this? <laughs> but, so I have a, tons of respect for actors, and I would say, very with what, what, what Monty's saying, and this is, after you get on a show, maybe for a while, once you've, um, shadowing a director is a great idea, too. A lot of our actors, almost all of our actors have shadowed, and so they see the prep, they see the locations, they see, what the director has to do. They come into the edit bay, and so they're all like, wow, this is the whole world, you know, and this is why all these decisions are being made. So um, if you get a chance to shadow a director and go through the beginning to end process, I, I did that last season, and it was hugely rewarding. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more craft, and then we're gonna do, talk a little bit about technical things as well. I see you have uh, your questions there. Lisa, can you, um, let's talk about moments of the scene, because every scene's written for something. There's a reason why that scene's in the, in the film, so the actors need to communicate that. So we'll start, um, we'll start with Lisa, but then everyone chime in. How do you, where do you look for that? Is it a look sometimes? Is it a thing that they say? How are you guys looking for that moment in the scene where it's a decision that an actor has to make that then propels the next scene and the next scene and so on and so forth? 
I'm always trying to figure out what the scene's really about. You know, especially in House of Cards, there's, the scene's always about two things. It's about advancing the plot line, but then it's about what's really happening. Who's manipulating who? Are they, is the person being manipulated? Do they know that they are? Are they buying the lie? And so for House of Cards, it's more about what's not being said uh, than what is being said. And I actually try really hard to keep all my lines off camera. I, I've had a couple of scenes that I've cut that there's almost no lines on camera and I think they end up being really interesting. And so I'm always looking for the reactions that are the things that are gonna make the scene work. Uh, and I build back from that. And uh, we'll talk a little more of these reactions. Maybe Jill, you can talk about the subtlety of those because some, sometimes an actor feels like, okay, did it come across? Did it not come across? And talk a little bit about how it's something in the eyes even can be that well, simple. Especially, especially, you know, this isn't stage acting. We're talking about television which everybody has big screen TVs in their houses. And so the most subtle, I just cut before I came down here tonight, I needed a reaction from an actor and her eyebrow, just one eyebrow just slightly went up and back down. That was perfect. I didn't need anything more than that. She gave me other things. She gave me, you know, more big, big eyes and a big reaction, but all I needed was that one eyebrow shifting because it totally plays. You can completely read it on the screen. Um, and the, uh, the other thing that uh, there's, a, there's a specificity and an attention, that listening that we were, we've been talking about, that's so important to me. I tend to cut where it's just a pattern that I, I break my rule as well, but my, my tendency is to cut right after an actor finishes their line and cut immediately to the person they're speaking to and let that person have a couple beats to consider what was just said before they say their line. So that it's that listening. I'm trying to get that moment of processing in before you react. And, and I appreciate the specificity of, of eye contact or of looking away so that I can cut to where you just looked. I follow your eyes. And so I love it when your eyes go somewhere where I want to be as an audience member slash editor. Then I'm going to cut to that. Where you look, I cut to that moment and then I can cut back to you having a reaction to what you just saw. So I'm always looking at your eyes. And, um, and finally, I like specificity at the end of a scene as well. Some actors like to sort of improvise and everything goes <laughs> at the end of the scene and that doesn't help me. That really hurts you and it hurts the momentum of the scene and it hurts the transition into the next scene. So some sort of steadiness and purpose when you're done helps me to propel us forward to the next scene. Why don't you maybe talk a little bit about um, that technical skill of eye contact, of um, using eye blinks, looking at certain things that you're gonna have show, um, close ups on objects. Talk about how you guys are using those, those technical things an actor does. Well, I, I personally find eye blinks really problematic and I don't, and I hesitate to say that to, to an audience of actors because I, I don't want you to be thinking, am I blinking or not? But um, in, when somebody is saying something, uh, there's a point when I want to cut. It isn't always when they finish talking. I don't want to cut r right after they've blinked. Okay, so I'll, I'll, st I'll st put it that way. Um, blinking to me often indicates untruthfulness even though in reality, social scientists say blinking is a sign of truthfulness. But I'm just saying, as audiences watching television or watching a big screen movie, we get pulled in when two people are talking at each other and they're really steady holding a gaze at each other. We, we become them, kind of. Uh, so for me, when an actor blinks a lot, it becomes a challenge on how I can play that. It, 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 be, it creates more work for me, but it's not about that because that's just what I'm paid to do. It's more, does it take away from my believing the person? And uh, this is very delicate because there's some actors who blink a lot and I still totally buy what they're, 
they're selling, and others, it, it just breaks it for me and I'm not with them. Uh, Rather than tell you, an audience of actors, whether to do one thing or another, I would just suggest when you watch dramatic scenes and you're watching particularly two people, check out yourself how you feel about what the actors are doing with their eyes. Because we, all of us here have become experts at looking at human faces and trying to decipher what frame by frame is being conveyed. And, we're, and it's so subtle because we humans are mysterious. And so we're, we're, is he happy? Is he sad? Does he buy that? It's always a question. And the eyes are the window to the soul, but they can also obviously be lying. So um, when I get dailies and I'm looking at things, uh, I've read the script, I've been to the tone meeting, I still don't know what the scene is about until I'm cutting it. So a mystery unfolds, and the mystery is what the actors are doing with their faces, to me, you know? I mean, if, unless it's just a purely exposition scene, he came in at 7.45 and he left his gun here and blah, blah. If it's straight ahead exposition, no. But I'm saying when there's human emotion being exchanged, uh, what the actors do, what they bring to it is the magic is the mystery of what we are as human beings. And if it's engaging, it pulls us in, and we want to really understand that. Sometimes we want to, we filmmakers want to be, it's ambiguous. And there's a lot of that in House of Cards that I love. It's like, did she buy that <laughs> manipulation? I'm not sure. You know, she, he sold it so well, she sold it so well. But that's what they're trying to create, right? Um, so, uh, I think, I, this is how I work as an editor. I watch a lot of other editors work. And I know as you as actors, you probably got into it because you love watching actors and you wanted to do the same. And so I, I would just suggest really focus on actors' voice and their eyes, what they're doing with their voice and what they're doing with their eyes. and see what intuitively that brings up for you. And that's, that goes back to, can you get in a cutting room? Because you might be surprised to see that you blink a ton of times that you're not conscious of, you know? Or you might say, wow, I can really be steady. This is a strength that I have, and work off that. But uh, even if it's in a small independent film and you know the director, try and get in the cutting room and see your stuff. You know, about the eye blinking, I think that there's, a, there's sort of a rule that Walter Murch came up with in editing, which is you want to cut on the frame before the eye blink. So if somebody looks at somebody else and says, you will never stop me from being president, you want to cut right before that blink. If they say, you will never stop me from being, you're, you're like my go-to guy for every example, I hope you don't mind. When they say, you know, I'm, you cannot stop me from being president. <laughs> like. There's nothing there. It just it kills all of the energy and it kills the intensity. And it feels like the longer you maintain this eye contact is the longer you're sending this unspoken message to your scene partner that conveys whatever it is you're trying to say. But if you're lying or you're uncertain of what you're saying, then when you start blinking, it works. Like, oh, I don't know who left the food, who stole the food out of the refrigerator. I mean, like, I don't know why you're looking at me. I couldn't possibly know. Like there, the blinking really works. But if you're somebody who's blinking all the time, like Monty was saying, and you don't realize it because you're not looking at your own footage from acting class or from shows that you've been in, you might be undercutting everything that you're saying unintentionally by just blinking all the time. And likewise, somebody who never ever blinks, that's, a, that's an indication that somebody's a sociopath in real life. <laughs> and in, and in, but in TV, like we try not to let people blink because the longer they hold that eye contact, the more intense and the richer the energy exchange is. And, and that's one of the main notes that I get from the network, actually. Can we hold a beat on blank, on this person, especially at the end of scenes? Can we hold a beat before we cut to the next scene? And I am giving them the absolute last frame because I like those beats as well. Now, why can't I hold the beat? Because someone blanked or because the director yelled cut. Yeah. <laughs> 
And that's usually what it is. The director yelled cut, and you guys go, oh, good, I can take a break. And because the director yelled cut, the, just the extra half a second is everything for me in the editing room. So maybe even you can modulate. The director yells cut, and you just hold it for half a second for me, because I'll keep going. I can take his or her voice out from the audio track and stay on your face, and it's super helpful. Great. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, line flubs, because we're humans and we do it all the time on set. Um, no one can get away from that. But sometimes we don't cut and you keep going and the actor backs up, right? So when do you, when have you seen that the actor needs to back up for you guys to do your job? Because they might take it, the line far too far or not enough, far, not far enough. So when do you guys need that? I think it's really helpful when you, when you flubbed and you know it, to not just repeat the word the correct way and then keep going. You know, let's say the line is, uh, you stole my food from the refrigerator. So if somebody says, you stole my fool food from the refrigerator, I can't use that take because I can either use the first half of it or I can use the last half of it, but I can't use the whole thing because the whole thing is you stole my food flub from the refrigerator. Can't do that. So what's more helpful for us is if you rewind to the beginning of the sentence or preferably for me, if you rewind to the beginning of the idea because I like to see you get the idea that motivates you to say the line. So somebody accuses you of stealing the food, and I like seeing that moment where you go, oh, should I lie or should I tell the truth? I'm gonna lie. I don't know anything about where the food came from. And if you flubbed in the middle, I may not be able to get that great little moment because you flubbed too soon. So I would say, I would prefer if you could go back to the beginning of the idea in the dialogue, you know, the beginning of the paragraph or the beginning of the emotional idea of what you're trying to convey or that emotional moment. If this is where you turned from being calm to being angry, go back and let's see that turn. And a good director is going to say to you, hey, let's take it from, and they're not going to arbitrarily choose a place. They're going to choose a place, hopefully that's the beginning of a beat. That's the beginning of an emotional moment. The other thing that you want to be wary of is if you're physically moving during the, the place where you flubbed. So let's say, uh, you stand up and say your line and you flub right away. What you're going to want to do is sit back down so that we can have the complete moment of you standing up and saying the proper line. And of course when you do that you need to give the camera crew time to adjust to the fact that you just sat back down again because you're in one focal place here and then when you stand up the focal point is different up here. So you got to give the camera person time to go readjust focus okay, we're ready for you, and then you can do it. But that's infinitely helpful to us because sometimes we'll get these performances that are just awesome, but there's a flub in the middle, and then I gotta cut to somebody else to cover the audio edit that I'm gonna have to do, and it's like sort of a random cutaway that I gotta make it look like it had a purpose, but really, I know the purpose, and hopefully nobody else can tell, but everyone in the audience is like, why is he cutting to the horse at that moment? <laughs> It, it really helps me if, if it is in the middle of a paragraph, not just to go back to the beginning of the sentence, but ask the actor you're working with to give you their last line again and start at the beginning of the paragraph because then you might possibly have that whole paragraph on camera, just like Jordan said. So it's helpful when the director says, let's, let's reset it back to and gives the other off-camera actor the chance to repeat their line so you get another chance to do the entire line of dialogue. Yeah, everybody flubs it at some point. Like, and no matter how good they are, they're bound at some point to blow it. And everybody on set gets it, and everybody in the cutting room gets it, and hopefully your scene partner is supportive enough and professional enough to get it too. So if you know that you blew it, like, don't think no one's gonna notice because the script supervisor is gonna say to the director, we gotta do that again because they messed up the line. And when I'm in the cutting room, I'm gonna be like, oh, this is awesome, awesome. Uh, I hope they get it again. Yeah. So if you know that you, you need to do it again, just say like, give, give me that line again, give yeah, me that line again, exactly. and do it until you get it right, because I'm gonna cut out all the stuff that doesn't work, and when it goes in the air, no one's gonna know. Like, we're gonna save your butt. That's our job, is to make you look as good as we can. And we want to make you look as good as we can. So we want you to give us that great performance, as much of it on camera as possible, so we can make the choices about how much to use, and we can show the emotion that you went through that led you to say or do whatever you just said or did. And similarly, but the opposite, when you are the scene partner and you're not the one on camera, if you could match your action. 
and don't be moving your head and don't be like if you were moving your head on the other side when or if you're planning on moving your head on the other side when it's your coverage okay but try to match your action and stay as steady as you can because sometimes I have to not use a great performance because the person whose back I'm on is messing it up for the actor who's on camera. So be generous with your scene partner when you're not the one that's being featured and try to maintain consistency as well at those moments. Great, um, Scandal's known for its fast paced dialogue. Um, I'm sure some of the actors sometimes get into a rhythm or they're really on top of each other. Can you guys talk a little bit about um, stepping over each other's lines, when that's appropriate, when that's not appropriate, that type of thing? Yeah, they do it all the time. <laughs> um, it's kind of part of their method at this point. Now they've done it, and we just kind of deal with it. To be totally frank, if you, it's obviously better if. Uh, let me let me get a little technical. If they're shooting just you with two cameras and a close up, that would be better for you not to be talking over their lines. But if they're shooting both of you at the same time, if they're if they're two scenes, they're shooting at the same time, and you're overlapping, that's totally fine because I can use the same audio track. Does that make sense? But I find that I will literally go in and I will find where in the argument of you yelling, I can make the cut to go to the other guy if they're overlapping and I'll just put those words in their mouth or whatever. I'm never gonna not use a good take because of, a, of an overlap. I also have incredible faith in the sound department to bail me out if I totally blow it and use an unused, usable take and they'll you know try to find something but um at least on my show they do it all the time and it's never the, um it's never been addressed and no one they just think oh our editors are great they can do it and so we're not going to complain we're just so yeah you know, we just well, do it the overlap to just so everybody understands what the challenge is editorially when there's overlap you know if if Lisa and I are having an argument and we overlap, it might be Lisa's best performance and my worst performance. And as the editor, they want to put my best performance in against Lisa's best performance. But if we're overlapping all our dialogue, then it's married together and we can't do that. But if they're not overlapping, then, then we have the opportunity to put in my best performance against her best performance. So that's why generally we say overlapping isn't great. The other problem is that uh, the sound of your voice may drown out a really important word from the other person and then that plot point or that name or that fact disappears because your voice is on top of it or if you're slamming the door while someone else says the guy with the gun was the slam <laughs> was it the butler and the candlestick like nobody knows because there's an overlap so that's why generally they say don't overlap but if the director says go for it you should go for it but I think editors in general would like to be able to have the flexibility because it saves us from having to go in and say, all right, well, as soon as they start overlapping, I can take that third syllable and cut to the good Jordan audio. But up until then, I'm stuck with the bad audio where he mispronounced the word, but Lisa put this great emphasis on the right word, and so I really want to keep Lisa's part, but I'm stuck with the bad Jordan part if I do that. One, and so that's yeah. why we ask people not to do it. One other thing, I mean, obviously it's better not to overlap for the editor, but if you know what kind of coverage you're in as well. If you're in a master and you're overlapping, that might be a little bit more forgiving than if you're in close-ups. If you're in close-ups, I want to be on you and I want to get your cleanest audio. I want to get all that. But if you're in a master, I might, you know, the overlapping might be easier to use. Yeah, I was going to actually say, you, you might want to overlap in the master because the argument's going fast and furious, and if we're in the master, it needs to keep having that tempo. But when you're in close-ups, when you're in your own coverage, we in the editing room can create that overlap, and it'll be cleaner and more effective. So don't worry. We'll make the pacing in the editing room. We will overlap you even if you gave us clean dialogue, and it'll be a brilliant argument that's much easier for all of us to work with. Great. Um, let's talk about the elephant in the room that's called continuity. It's something that some actors do really well and some actors maybe not so much. So one, um, talk a little bit about that in your experience of when it really worked, when the actors were super aware and sometimes what were situations where you're like, oh my gosh, this happened and we have to solve this problem. You know what, I, I actually think I, maybe it's not a good idea to say it to a room full of actors, but continuity is the least of my problems. Right. The only times it matters, and it really matters, is standing and sitting, crossing the room, 
you know, right hand, left hand, when you're eating, when you did that, you can get around it. If you are editorially, emotionally in the right place at the right time, nobody's going to notice the little things. But the big things matter. I can't have somebody stand up twice in the scene in two different times. I can't have somebody walk across the room and, uh, you know, you've got to do the big things. But the big things matter. The little things, if you're just in the moment, emotionally, then it'll carry the scene and it doesn't matter. Yeah, one funny thing about that, um, I really don't care about matching and we have, I've worked with some actors where they're so method and into it that literally everything's different every time and if they're pacing back and forth, the lines are different on every single take and it's brutal for the editor's cut because you're like, how am I gonna make this work? But it's great in the producer's cut when you have to take 15 minutes out of the cut and they're like, I don't want this line here, I want this line here, you know, and you're gonna cut out that middle, and oh, I have a take where he's over there, so it won't be a problem. Uh, so if you're in the, mo obviously you should try to do it, but I have found when I work with actors that don't match at all, it's been fine, it doesn't matter. Even literally getting up on the wrong side of the room at the wrong time, I'll make it right the first time, and then when we change the scene to be something else, I'll use the other stuff later. I have had the opposite experience, so I'm going to be the devil's advocate here, where I've had an incredibly beautifully emotional scene between a father and his son, and the network note back was, the continuity is bad, fix it. And these were beautiful performances, and I had to change them because the continuity was wrong. So it does depend. I mean, especially like if you're drinking a cup of coffee and then the coverage on the backside and we see that the coffee cup is down here, it will take you out of the scene if the continuity is not correct. So pre-plan a little bit. You know, yes, sometimes it doesn't matter. Like I've had someone pick up a fork with their left hand and on the other side they're holding it with their right hand. And because I cut on the movement, nobody knows that that fork just switched hands. So we can do tricks in the editing room, but just to protect yourself and the other actors that you're working with, if you can pre-plan when you're going to pick up that coffee cup and sip it, when you're going to walk across the room, it helps everybody out. What's really important is if you, is you, you should maintain the timing of when you do it for the other actor's sake as well. So, you know, if, if my scene partner is holding something and I'm looking at it and they've lifted, like, hey, you like that? You like that cup of coffee? My eyes are going to follow that. Mm -hmm. So she's got to lift it up at the same time on the coverage looking at her that she does at the coverage looking at me, or else it's going to be really screwy b because the audience is well aware that something's moving up and down, and, and the, my eyes are looking in the wrong place because in her coverage she didn't lift it yet. So that's another place where I think it does become a big issue. Like little things are little things, and like Lisa said, if you're really in the moment of the scene, you shouldn't be tracking it, but big stuff like suddenly they're on the bottom of the staircase instead of the top of the staircase, or they've stood up multiple times, or the cop crosses the room to slam on the desk three times in the scene, or the handcuffs are on, now they're off, now they're on, now they're off, now he's got a hat. Like that stuff, <laughs> that bumps me out of a scene in a big way. Like I can let some of the smaller stuff go, but when I start seeing stuff jump around, and then it makes me aware that I'm watching a constructed artificial reality, and everybody's working so hard to create this illusion of this magical pretend world. And if the papers suddenly are in someone's hand and then they're on their head and in their hand again, it just takes me out. And then I start thinking about, oh, these are actors and that's fake set and that city didn't really get nuked and like, it just pulls me out of it. Um, we're about to wrap up, but I'm gonna start with Monty and um, We've talked about a lot of things, but if there's one thing you kind of want to leave the actors with, one thought, one thing specific to um, the, the, the TV um, drama world, what would that be? And then we'll just kind of work our way down the panel. Well, coming off of talking about continuity, uh, I read a quote from Martin Scorsese who said he doesn't give a damn about continuity, and he points to a specific scene in The Godfather where Michael Corleone comes back from Sicily and he's going to try and woo again Diane Keaton, and she's teaching at a girls' school, and they have a conversation in a driveway, and it's so mismatched, and the continuity is so horrible, you can't believe it. It would make your hair stand on end if you had any hair. 
But the scene works tremendously because one, they're not crossing the room and nobody's standing up and sitting down. Those issues aren't there. It's just you're locked in on the story, you're locked in on this great acting. And so in one, literally one scene he's like this and then on the other shot over her, he's, he's not. And when you're looking for it, it's wow, that's crazy. But if you're just watching the movie, it's wow, he wooed her back. He, he destroyed her emotionally, and here he is working it back, and, and it's a tremendous scene. And so that, for me, as an editor, made me start forgetting the importance of continuity. And I think, as actors, um, really doing your craft so that you're in the moment and giving a great performance is what you really, really need to focus on. And certainly if you're working with somebody else and there's something material that you're using or a piece of equipment or something, you do want that to be, you know, for your fellow actors, for everybody, you do want that to be consistent as, as much as possible. But we as audiences are really, if it's not working emotionally, the rest is kind of unimportant. Um, so uh, I'm looking for great performances and I, here, what happens in the cutting room stays in the cutting room. I don't know about my fellow editors, but I curse from mo morning to night. <laughs> what the hell is it? <laughs> and it's the tension of trying to create something, you know? I mean, I don't hate actors, I don't hate directors, I don't hate writers. It's just the tension of trying to create something. I'm pulling my hair, I'm screaming, yelling. But at the end of the day, I forget what I was struggling with if the scene works. And so that's what we're all trying to do. We're all trying to make scene work and then episodes work. Uh, so my bottom line to you as actors is, once again, uh, because this is not theater we're talking about, we're talking about filmed performances. If you get any opportunities to wa watch your film's performance and then see what the dailies were and talk with the editor, what, what did you struggle with? What was great? How did it go for you? I think it'll be a world of good for you. That's the most practical advice that I could offer. Well, I just want to say that every time I get a new script, I will read it. And inevitably, there are lines in the script that I think, what does that even mean? I don't understand. It doesn't make it, oh, I'm going to cut that out. And then I see the actor perform those lines, and it opens up this whole vista for me. Like, oh my goodness, you make these lines live, you make them believable, you make them meaningful. And I, so my hat is off to you. I have so much respect for your craft and what you can do, what you bring to the process. And all I wanna do is show that in its best light. That's what I'm in that room doing for you. And um, I, hope I, I hope I do that for you. I hope we all do that for you. I hope you are happy with the work we do for you. Thank you. Uh, I would just say, like, you should realize that we're your allies and that we're looking out for you and that we really legitimately love what you guys do. We wouldn't be in this business if we didn't really relish watching these performances over and over and living in these rich emotional worlds that actors create. And, you know, when, when something amazing happens in my dailies, I always try to get someone to come in and, and show it to them and say, like, you can't believe this. And it's just happened so much on Homeland where somebody does something amazing and we just watch it over and over and just we just can't believe how lucky we are to get to watch this stuff. So, so the editors are your allies and I know that you guys really put yourselves out there and you're really vulnerable and, and it's really courageous the things that you do and I just want you to know that we see what you're doing and we appreciate it and we value it very much. There's some actors who always bring out the best in the other actors. And I think that's something that you should be aware of, that it may not be your scene, it may not be your moment, you might not be on camera, but there are some actors that are always in the moment when they're delivering their lines to their scene partner, when we're on their back, and they bring out the best in the other actor, and a, they can really go a long way to taking a weak performance from somebody else and lifting it up. So you should really be aware of that and be that actor. 
Um, the thing that I look for from my writer or my director or my showrunner and really from my actor is take a point of view. Have something that you want to get across. Make it make a choice, make a decision. You know, I hate it when I get a director and he shoots five masters and then he comes to the bay and he goes, well, why'd you pick that one? I said, well, someone had to pick something, you know? <laughs> we gotta get this on air. So as an actor, you need to make, you need to have a point of view. You have to have an under, just have a point of view, make a decision, understand why your character is doing something. And a lot of the times on a smaller part, they're not gonna help you get there. Um, so you need to bring it because that's what's going to be interesting for me. That's why I'm going to be like, oh, look at this person's doing this. Just really be focused on what you're trying to get across and why you're trying to get it across. That's the best advice I could give. Well, on behalf of the actors in the room, we thank you for the amazing work that you guys are doing for sure, right? Yeah. Thank you again. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your advice. We appreciate you. And you guys have a wonderful evening as well. Thanks again for coming out. Thank you, everyone.